a friend of mine was recently saying, um, hey, you know, they're they're going to attack Monero, you know that, you know, the, as it gains uh, market cap and, you know, as it gains sort of prominence on the charts and on the rankings and everything, you're going to start seeing attacks. What, what, and I'm like, you know what, Monero is going to continue providing privacy, private transactions and cash like basically digital cash. It's going to continue being digital cash at any price. So, yes, they can manipulate the price, but they cannot like beyond that. How else can they attack it? You know, mm -hmm. because I feel like that's that's probably the one biggest risk. And I think all cryptocurrencies are exposed to that risk. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android, too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. CakeWallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you, and supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Nam Sadar. Nam needs no introduction in Monero Land. Doug and Nam sit back and jam about the importance of digital cash and why they see Monero as their best shot at having true cash in the digital age. Monero Talk starts next. Nam. Nam or Nam? I, sh I should I should know this by now. I call you Nam, but I feel like it's you should be your correct pronunciation is Nam. Is that correct? Nam. Nam. All right. So I yeah. am. Right. Okay. So all Indian people whose name is Namrata, they go with Nam. It's just okay. So I'm, yeah, I'm better than I'm I thought. Yeah, you're good. So yeah, Monero. Yeah, you were asking how we're doing. We're doing well. We. Uh, we, you know, we were really happy with how Monero Topia turned out. We had a great time. We're glad that you were a big part of it. it was, I had a great time too. So I was think it your, was a great event. Was that your first time giving a Monero talk? Yeah. Yeah. You did a great yeah, yeah, job. Yeah. Great job. Thank, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That means a lot. How'd you feel about it? I know, I know the uh, audio visual wasn't the best. Apologies for that. But other than that, uh, how how'd you feel about giving the talk and how it went down? You, um, so the audiovisual, you know, turned out really good after the editing. So yeah. wherever we didn't get good slides yes. um, or the slides didn't show up clearly, you know, we had the overlays and it, it all worked out really good. So that's so I'm happy with that. Um, the actual talk was like I was a little bit nervous and you know one of the reasons i didn't like I, I i guess like socialize a lot at the conference i was um i was holed up in my room and then i just came uh, my thing uh, yeah that's and, like like when you're a student right like you always want to go first i'm surprised but you didn't want to go first you had i think you had specifically asked me right that you wanted oh no you did want to move it right but i was have... like what if we just get it over with in the morning and then i'll be relaxed you know I'll be able to hang out for the rest of the day but then you had it all programmed and I was like, okay, we'll do it that way. And uh, yeah, I think it worked out well. So I, I was towards the evening, like six. I think I finally went on quarter to seven or something like that. But, you know, it was a good time to get on. I think I was one of the last like serious talks and then we started having music and everything, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. No, your, your talk definitely got a lot of attention. So, all right, next time we'll, we'll put you up in the front so you could uh, enjoy the conference. <laughs> no worries. I don't think I'll... <laughs> As enjoy time. it a little bit. I mean, there was a, there were a lot of a lot of cool people there to to chat with. Did you have any? I did. I did. Um, I met new people. I caught up with older people, like people I knew. So it was good. Cool. Interesting cool. people. I'm sure you had a great time. You were just, you know, this was your thing, and you put so much effort into it. And I, I mean, I think it was wonderful the way it turned out. The energy was so good. Yes, thank you. No, we had a great time. I mean, obviously, it was stressful, but it was good stress. Mm. But you know, I just wish, I wish we had a little bit more time before the conference started. Like we showed up the day before, and we're getting ready on the fly, and like people started coming mm. in that morning, and we were still like putting banners up. So, so other, you know, yeah. that, we we made it unnecessarily like extra stressful. 
So yeah. lessons learned for next time. We'll definitely do things a little differently. But yeah. uh, no, it was all it was all uh, good stress. I had a good time. And next time you'll spread it out, right? A little more, like over two days, I think. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. What you yeah. Were saying. I mean, we got we got a bunch of ideas. I was thinking of maybe trying to do the next one in New York. I was telling you this, trying to do you it. Were in, telling me this. Do it in New York. Yeah. Um, Are you still going with that plan? I haven't totally decided. I'm waiting for it to like galvanize in my mind, and then like that's the direction I'm going. Like I haven't really like when I did Monero Topia the first time. Like one, it like hit me one day, and it just all made sense. Like gonna do it in Miami during this time, and it like clicked. Mm -hmm. I haven't had that that moment yet for the second one. Um, mm -hmm. So haven't made the final decision, uh, but leaning towards it mostly because New York in October is really nice. End of end of October, mm -hmm. Halloween would be cool. People could show mm -hmm. up in costume, you know, if they want to, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And then just the the feeling in New York right now, as I'm sure you're aware, is just mm -hmm. that of this, you know, growing dystopia. You know, mm -hmm. there there are those that are seemingly okay with it, but I think there's there's an undercurrent. There's a lot of people here in New York that are fed up. And I think if they heard that there's a New York Freedom Fest going on, they might check it out. And then Monero oh, obviously sure. would be, you know, the main element of that. But I'd, I'd, I'd try to bring in non-crypto people uh, that just want to get a taste of freedom again. That is so important to onboard new people and not just, you know, we're not looking at uh, expanding within just the crypto space, which is so limited. It's such a small percentage of human, the human population that owns any crypto today. Uh, so yeah. it's so ex important to appeal and to reach out and to get those people interested who want, uh, who are, um, yeah, looking to, to for ways to obtain financial freedom, just freedom in general, I think, that we're losing day by day, I think. Is that what drove you into crypto in the first place? This, yeah, of, yeah, uh, dystopia creeping upon us. Yeah, I mean, so I had a moment when um, the whole pandemic began, uh, sort of early 2020, where um, I was really busy with my life, you know, all the way from 2012, since my older son was born, all the way till then, till 2020. Like, I was really caught up in my day to day. Um, I was sucked into like my job and my kids. Like, that's all I ever did. I didn't think about any of the aspects sort of impacting humanity and, you know, like just where we are as, as a people, where we're going, what's our future, what's my kids' future going to be like, what kind of world are they going to live in? I, and I, I was just so absorbed by my own issues that I couldn't, I couldn't like go much further than that. Um, but when this whole thing was announced and everything turned around and, you know, like we have a lot of Americans living here um, or when I was in Oman, I'm in UAE now, but um, they all had, they were all called back. It was like, everybody come back and everybody just kind of go back to their countries. And it was, it was weird. Like, you know, there's a lot of expats where we live and everybody just suddenly leaving and, you know, they're saying air travel is banned and, you know, all of this happened. So I, immediately started having these like a premonition uh where i'd heard a like and sort of like an advice or like a forecast by aaron russo he was um director a movie director and he was like a music producer he owned he was i think from chicago and then eventually ended in like his final days were in um, nevada or sort of around hollywood hmm. and he was a big freedom fighter, you know, and he wanted to alert people on uh, a lot of the stuff that he knew about. And he was actually making a movie about the Fed and stuff like that. So and then he mysteriously like or he had an illness and like he passed away and stuff like that. But like one of his interviews that he recorded before all of this happened, it was actually with Alex Jones. It's not on YouTube anymore, obviously. Uh, you'd have to look for it elsewhere. But he was talking about a lot of this stuff. And um I could clearly like hear his voice say, you know, there's going to be a system where all money is going to be on a chip and so on and so forth. It's going to be fully controlled by a uh, very few people and they're going to decide who gets to continue using that money that's theirs, you know, in their accounts um, that they've earned, but they'll, they'll, they'll have 
or not have access to it, depending on a bunch of other criteria, like social credits and all that. So he didn't use the word social credits, but he did alert, I think, people, whoever saw what he was saying. And, you know, that gentleman's advice just kind of stayed kind of really like, really like in the back part of my head, completely forgotten about it. But, um, but I, the reason I actually even saw that interview in the first place was when I was looking into vaccines with my older son's uh, injury um, and all of that. So like I spent a long time looking at stuff and like I found, I don't know why one thing led to another and like I ended up with this video, but like I found a lot of different stuff and then I put it behind me and it was <clears throat> completely out of the picture. But then, yeah, like, like you said, like early 2020, when the dystopia kind of started to kick in, I was, I was just, I had this voice ringing in my head and it was like, all money is going to be on a chip and it's going to be controlled by a few people and they're going to decide who gets to use it or not, or you get to fly or not and all that. And I was like, and then I just went into this frantic, crazy search for um, a way out of the banks you know, um, or a way to not out of the banks necessarily, but like a way to um, sort of protect your wealth. I wasn't necessarily looking for like a moonshot, you know, like multiplying my wealth. I was just simply looking for some somewhere uh, to park money that was not going to be at uh, the mercy of Uncut a few. Yeah. yeah, right, right. So then one thing led to another and I discovered crypto. All of that happened, you know, all at the same time. Um, of course, my journey was through the dollar vigilante. I found those videos and I found the crypto vigilante. I subscribed to all of that stuff. And uh, they're big on privacy, you know, as you know. Um, and they're big on, oh, I think, a lot of privacy coins. But like the one that really stuck with me was Monero uh, because I feel like it's decentralized enough that... I think it ch checks all the boxes for me personally in, in what I look for in a good cryptocurrency. So I know there's a lot of privacy coins. I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying anything, but like, I like a lot of them. Um, I have nothing against, I'm not a maxi or anything, but I do like Monero because uh, for me, I like have very little doubt in my mind that it's spread out over a lot of hundreds of thousands of miners mining in different locations and that just makes it secure for me it's not it's not something that they can go to a few different mining farms and tell them you you're shut down you're shut down you're shut down because you're regulated companies you know you trade on the on the nasdaq or whatever um or in the toronto stock market or or such such you know uh regulated exchanges and you're going to only or if you want to continue operations you're only going to mine certain transactions that we tell you or we whitelist or, or none of that with monero right that's just it's just the beauty of having um basement mining like cpu mining low cost mining uh asic resistant mining with random x and everything it's just it just appeals to me uh, on a completely different level and i feel like it's that's the it's the secret within the crypto space uh, that not a lot of people know about, which is why when I see someone who's got Monero in their profile, I just, I'm so, you know, my respect for them just goes like 10x because I feel like in 2022, where you got all these, like you got ADA, Cardano and Solana and like all of these glitzy, glamorous, like nice uh, DeFi coins that have done so well price-wise. Um, cause obviously they've got like corporate boosts, you know, there's, um, teams behind them. There's, of course, there's a team behind Monero as well, but there's like centralized teams. These are all centralized coins. I don't think any of them have any kind of decentralization, even comparable to Bitcoin or Monero. But I feel like with a lot of this stuff for, to, for someone in the crypto space to navigate and find their way to Monero, that, and that's just, it's nice. It's nice to have that sort of person around you to be able to relate to them because i think they've sorted through so much we live in an in an era of too much information like back hundreds of years ago my ancestors you know they used to worship books because they said books are knowledge books are what lead to human um sort of uh, evolution you know what helps humanity grow and learn and become more civilized 
well, today we're in the opposite place. We're just bombarded with useless information and, and being able to navigate through that, through all the noise and getting to what really matters. I think a lot of people in the Monero space have made that effort and they've done that. So why? I mean, we obviously found Monero. Um, there's a lot you of know what? I don't know your story, though. How did oh. you find it? I'm not going to tell I've told it so many times. It's just on oh, this podcast, people probably just turn it off. I mean, I, I basically <laughs> got in and like... Short version, like in 30 Short seconds. version, you know, had heard about Bitcoin numerous times, but never stopped to like look at it and understand it. Was was actually interested in the concept of digital cash before, you know, I've heard mm-hmm. of Bitcoin. Um, but I just thought it was like some like, technically impossible thing to pull off so i just thought it was a centralized thing had no idea um and then actually dogecoin uh i saw oh, some yeah. article on it in late 20, <laughs> it was christmas eve on 20 you know 2013 and i bought 50 dollars worth of dogecoin just for the purposes of like trying to you know turn it into you know five thousand dollars without understanding the technology at all Woke up the next morning and all my Doge was stolen because I s- stored it on an online wallet, which is like rule number one. Um, yeah. And you know they they hacked the you know they hacked the wallet and they they stole everyone's Doge. And I was like, there's no way crypto works like this. I'm like, this is a, this is a horrible invention if this is the case. I'm like, there's mm-hmm. got to be a way where you can like safely hold your crypto or something. And mm-hmm. that led me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I was a BTC maxi for quite some time. Um, and all of, you know, 2014, I was just like hoping for price to go down further and further. And, and it, it kept going down. I had a great, a great bear market there and I was just accumulating Bitcoin. And it was when I actually started to go use Bitcoin that I really saw the flaw, the, you know, the lack of privacy and the fact that it was the opposite. It was complete. It was utterly transparent. Uh, yeah. you know, and it was, it was in the early days, you know, I'd send some Bitcoin to friends to like introduce them to it. And then like, yeah. you know, you know, they're, they're looking on the blockchain and be like, oh, cool. You have this much Bitcoin. That's awesome that you like that you're able to like, you know, get that. Cool. You know, like and then I'm thinking, you know, what do I want like people to be able to like look back at my my address and see? And then I'm thinking, you know, who else could see this? And like, well, the whole world can see. And then so that's how I found my way to Monero. I was actually interested in, you know, in finding digital cash. And I actually, you know, was excited about Zcash when it was first coming out. I was curious what that was going to be. Um, mm-hmm. And I was looking at, I was looking at Monero. I was looking at Zcash. I was even looking at Dash, you know, granted this, mm-hmm. this is before all these things were so obvious. Um, and yeah. yeah, after analysis, I mean, Monero was, was the obvious choice. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like once you start to really understand it, then it becomes kind of the only choice for, you know, for if you want, if you're really looking for digital cash. And that's what got me so excited about Bitcoin in the first place. You know, all those yeah. things we're talking about, unconfiscatable, you know, it's uh, resistant to, you know, being co-opted by any government or corporation. That's what got me most excited about crypto. Absolutely. And when I saw Monero doing that better than any other i literally you know i I remember i remember this moment when i was like taking a shower and i'm like you know i I got i still have you know i'm still mostly bitcoin but i really love monero and i made the conscious decision of you know what i'm gonna fight for monero because it's what i believe in in terms of crypto and Mm -hmm. i like completely forgot about price and i was like you know what in 10 years if you know, my Monero would have made me, you know, a, a mega millionaire. I mean, my Bitcoin and then my Monero would have ma- only made me, you know, a millionaire, but not super mega. I'm like, I'd, I'd be OK with that. Like I made the conscious decision because I, at the end of the day, I'd have completely untraceable digital cash and I'd be, you know, achieving my end goal. Um, yeah. And that, that that's that's my Monero story in, in short. And um that's a, that's a lovely story. <laughs> and I, I've stuck with it since. You know, I've always said this show, the, the goal of Monero Talk was to discover true digital cash. And I, I try to maintain an open mind. Obviously, mm. you know, my, my bags are Monero. So, I, you know, full disclosure, I mean, I can only be so objective. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I, I still feel like to this day, it, it, more than ever, I, I'm convinced by Monero because of what we've seen. Uh, it's now not so much what could be; it's it's here, right? So we've seen it gain adoption on on the dark dark markets. We see it essentially winning the use cases digital cash. So 
That's why mm. I continue to be uh, bullish about Monero. I don't really see anything else that that makes sense that might, that will take it take it out. Uh, is that is that your opinion of Monero? Like, are you still like searching? Or are you still are you more open minded than I am? I mean, uh, where where are you currently at? I'm open to um, privacy coins because I feel like that is where the fight, the real fight, will will come in. So I think so. The way I see it is, I have a lot of respect for Bitcoin. It's done. It 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 opened the gates of crypto. It's the first real true cryptocurrency. Um, I mean, it introduced humanity to what to a next level of freedom to be able to self custody your wealth, um, to be able to transact. You know, um, mm -hmm. as long as there's no KYC, there's no, um, you know, there's relative like um, untraceability available. Uh, you'd have to be uh, pretty good at you know getting there. Uh, in today's world, where most Bitcoin is available on centralized exchanges, post K K KYC, um, and all kinds of uh, identity identification um, checks and everything. But, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, people in Bitcoin are aware about how to go about it um, in an untraceable way. So kind of use it similar to the way you would use Monero. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think... Um, most people aren't, you know, most people aren't able to do that. And I don't think it's as simple as using Monero. I mean, so the way I see it is you have a very simple alternative that provides complete, um, that provides all the benefits that a cryptocurrency should provide. Um, that was the initial intention of why crypto was actually needed in this world. And we have sort of like the living example in Monero then why would you go for a more difficult um, sort of uh, process and a more difficult experience as a user? You know, like I don't have the IT knowledge uh, to be able to use Bitcoin privately and be completely sure that I'm doing it right. Crypto space is literally just a 0.0000000001% of humans that would, you know, that exist. So the, you know, we're talking about wider adoption and we're talking about onboarding, you know, a good percentage of humanity onto crypto. I, I don't see how that's going to easily happen with a cryptocurrency that provides that that uh, has obstacles to like the correct use of crypto the way it should be used. Uh, Monero does that without any sort of hurdles. It's just designed like that and it's continuously improving itself. Um, to continue providing that privacy. So a friend of mine was recently saying, um, hey, you know, they're they're going to attack Monero. You know that, you know, the, as it gains uh, market cap and, you know, as it gains sort of prominence on the charts and on the rankings and everything, you're going to start seeing attacks. What it, what, and I'm like, you know what? Monero is going to continue providing privacy, private transactions and cash, like basically digital cash. It's going to continue being digital cash at any price. So yes, they can manipulate the price, but they cannot like beyond that, how else can they attack it? You know, mm -hmm. because I feel like that's, that's probably the one biggest risk. And I think all cryptocurrencies are exposed to that risk. But anyway, you asked if I'm, if I'm sort of seeing eye to eye with you on that. And I feel like I, you know, I do, you know, I feel like there's a lot of nice, good, there's a good, uh, there's a, there's good privacy projects out there. And whenever a new one comes out, my eyes are on it, you know, you can be sure. Um, and I'm checking to see how it compares to Monero. Monero to me is like the sort of like the standard. And then I have to see if, you know, if there's anything that comes out that's kind of better than that. But like, and you know, some projects claim better privacy, but I'm just not that sure about the decentralization aspect. I think Monero's kind of gone through that whole battle testing uh, since right, 2014 yeah. where... Yeah, I don't, see, I don't see how you can replicate that, right? Because that only comes with time. It comes exactly. with proof, it comes with proof of work. It comes with time, proof of work. Yeah. Um, so to to just be a you know create a new a new project that's trying to do the same thing, there's just, there's just no way to replicate what Monero has already achieved in terms of, like you said, in, in terms of decentralization. Mm. So I mean, how do you have something that's 10x better when really most of the value is in the decentralization itself. That's like what where eighty percent of the value is, or whatever. It's very super high percent is just in the fact that it's this decentralized system, which is why 
I think Bitcoin, you know, like you said, continues to have value and is an important project because it is also, mm -hmm. you know, very much decentralized. Um, yes. Even just because of the amount of time it's been around and the amount of people that now mm -hmm. have it. I don't know where do you where do you see Monero going? What's your what's your current take? Are you um, is it living up to your expectations? I guess right. So you got in in twenty twenty. Um, you know you, you've been looking at it ever since. Are you shocked by where we are? are you, you know were you expecting more? Expecting less? What's what's like your 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 take so far? Um, so since I've gotten in, it's um, been delisted from almost every major exchange except for Binance. Uh, I think Binance US has it. Uh, Binance US? I don't think so. Yeah. Do Kraken. Kraken has it. Kraken has it. Yeah. Kraken US has it. Kraken UK delisted. Um, right. But And the Binance, like the traditional Binance that we all use uh, except for the US Binance, um, has it right? Uh, but I thought the U.S. Binance still had it. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's literally just like a handful of exchanges, large ones that uh, mm -hmm. continue to hold and have any market sort of in uh, in Monero. So I keep wondering, hey, how does you know how does Monero price even get determined on a day to day basis? Because most of it is traded uh, off these large exchanges. But I think I guess. You know, they do say, OK, so Kraken price, Binance price and a few other uh, whoever might be still trading it, like the smaller exchanges, they'll just kind of compile that and say this is the price right now. So but I think that's still not even a determinant sort of number, you know, so I feel like we're, we're seeing a um, almost no liquidity. Um, and especially when recently we had the Monero run. And a lot of people pulled out their Monero from the exchanges. That was really funny. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> that like that we actually saw like a rise in price, right? I mean, yeah. I think mostly just because it brought attention to Monero. But but go ahead. Uh, so so I feel like um, okay. So having price determine Monero's uh, value, I feel that concept in itself is. And, you know, comparing it to all of these transparent coins that rank like one to 25. We're at 24 today, by the way. Congratulations. Yeah. Past um, cash. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty cool. So what I'm saying is, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is my my understanding of Monero, the, the, you know, in terms of the benefits it provides as money, because as uh, Dr. Kim says, the best sort of... Um, the, the, the best uh, invention or the best part of the Nakamoto protocol is the its utilization as money. Mm. And that's literally like the, the most valuable uh, portion of the utilization of that blockchain. And the fact that, uh, you know, the fact that Monero just continues to do what it does beautifully and we have improvements and now we're having, um, you know, like I think the last... Uh, fork i don't know if it's happened or if it's about to happen is going to increase the ring ct number to 16 mm -hmm. um so that we're just getting a lot more privacy yeah, we're getting uh, view tags which is going to see you're going to see a 40 percent increase in efficiency of how fast you know your 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 mobile mm -hmm. wallet loads i mean that's that's going to be insane yeah that's important maybe, because... maybe i'm being a little overboard for me that's insane like you know because I, I use it mm -hmm all the time and it does it does yeah. you know it does you know compared to something like bcash right like they don't really have that problem obviously we have that problem for a reason but to mm. see that we're going to improve in in those ways is is exciting but that's ahead. amazing right you just yeah. yeah imagine you're waiting all that time for your wallet to synchronize and now it's just boom um what else does hold what is what else could hold it back like what could you find against it for all all that it does Let yeah what, what do you like, see that's what i was going to ask you next like what do you see as the biggest risks for monero like what are you concerned about i mean is, what, what what would keep you up at night in terms of monero like like a three-letter agency cracking its uh privacy that's the only risk yeah. i think like that's yeah. a real risk i don't see any other risk where it hasn't already been attacked or you mm -hmm. know kind of what they do is they keep it out of the news um we don't see a lot being spoken about it so right now we're going through the phase where we're where we're um not gonna like we're just gonna be avoided i think except for the noise that we make within the community but 
uh, yeah, you because like I scrolled. I was looking before this episode, before we were recording. I was like, let me see what's going on with Monero. Like, let me just check the news articles. There's almost nothing. So I feel like it's just we're going through this process where they're doing everything to kind of keep it down so that not pe many people know what this amazing thing is, um, why it's useful, like why. So I feel like, OK, um, imagine uh, one of the biggest attacks that it could Monero could have, like any crypto could have, like I feel like Bitcoin's facing it right now, is they um, entities that are not interested in seeing Bitcoin succeed would buy up a lot of Bitcoin and then, you know, pump its price, obviously, mm -hmm. and then just drop it like uh, that New Year's Eve, that ball that you have from... <laughs> like so, Luna. <laughs> yeah, not like Luna. I mean, it's still at, uh, hovering around 30, but... <laughs> that it, you know hasn't gone to zero but just drop it like that and have like a 50 like a 60 percent drop and from all from the most hyped up price range and that i think damages uh cryptocurrencies credibility mm -hmm. like so i was thinking okay imagine if monero's five thousand dollars and on the market and i was using it you know in a circular economy like i was buying my coffee with it i was buying my groceries with it by supplies with it and kind of using it in a, in a circular economy and then all of a sudden it went to 200 you mm -hmm. know where it is today yeah so i would be pissed off like i would say hey uh what just happened to my purchasing power like that pisses me off like i don't want that yeah so if it's gonna be at 200 and it's slowly gonna creep up as more and more people organically discover it Mm -hmm. um which i think is what's happening with monero because that's honestly like it's one of the most hardest cryptocurrency to uh, even discover you know it's um you're likely to kind of maybe get to monero if you're a bitcoin maxi but you got to be an open-minded bitcoiner mm -hmm. to come around to monero because a lot of the narrative in that space is about i mean i, I it's unbelievable but some people still call it a shit coin like i'm just like you like do you even know what crypto is you know uh so that like if there's if there's not a lot of things that trigger me like i do yoga and i meditate and everything but if there's a, if there's something that triggers me it's seeing monero and shitcoin in the same sentence and then just i just have to jump in i try not to do it but i'm just like how can somebody be that ignorant in 2022 right. when you know when you're so close to bitcoin and you love it then what do you not love about monero like it's just we're their brothers like if you're gonna if you're gonna like try and fight forces that want to confiscate your wealth <laughs> that are centralized in nature and that want to concentrate uh, all power in like a few entities that a very few people run then you're gonna need more than a transparent you know a transparent blockchain to do that like honestly you're never going to do that just with a transparent blockchain that may be as decentralized as they come uh, which is the claim right but they're all sort of decentralized in these massive asic farms that people have put billions of dollars even millions at least um of investment to get started right so if a guy is putting in putting down millions and millions to mine bitcoin that guy is not going to let his operation get shut down on hardware and that can't be used for anything else for anything else yeah. so imagine i'm putting down millions and millions on the, into this bitcoin farm i've got all my cheap electricity lined up and you know i've got everything like going and now the regulator comes to me knocks on my door and says hey you know uh hope you're having a good day but here's a list of regulations and you're going to have to comply with all of this if you want to keep doing your business um hello <laughs> what happens to the you know censorship resistant aspect then that right. literally goes for a toss right yeah Miss, mr businessman is going to be like but i love you know i love the censorship resistance of bitcoin no exactly. be, yes sir let me know you know let me know what i need to do as long as i keep the you know keep the miners running and i could you know exactly. be the, uh, the sole provider of <laughs> exactly so mining. my so my assessment of a good cryptocurrency is keep all of these mining farms aside like push them all to the side mm -hmm. and let me know how many people are you know buying asics and mining it in their resist in sorry in their basements or in their homes you know or maybe like 
little, little farms like here and there. Like I may have five or 10 ASIC computers in, in my sort of uh, control um, that are, you know, maybe around the town over here where I live. Let's say I get good electricity and I want to do that. But I'm not, I'm talking about such mining. I'm talking about like how, so what's the hash rate of such miners versus like all of these large farms that can literally, that somebody can just knock on the door as easy as knocking on the door. Um, how do you identify that the farm exists even in the first place? Well, look at their electricity consumption. So if your ASICs are so heavy, like dependent on, on electricity, like let's face it, right? It's easy for somebody on the electric grid. Like all you got to do is put an analyst in some back office in some town, like in Texas and say, Hey, tell me who's consuming more electricity than like this normal, what it, the, what's I mean, for we, hours. Yeah, we, we saw it in come China. Up with a list. Yeah. We saw it in China. It's not even theoretical. I mean, you just see it, it dropped off like a cliff, you know? And then right. the Bitcoiners were like, Oh no, but it's great. Cause now it's moving to the U S but like they, they failed to point out the, you know, what, what became apparent as the obvious flaw that, you know, governments can so easily influence uh, Bitcoin miners. Yeah. yeah, and and they're not going to shut them down because I think for the most part, Bitcoin has kind of like if Bitcoin was this angry beast oh, in 2012 and 20, uh, sorry, in, um, yeah, 2012, 2013, 2014, 15. Now it's completely been defanged. <laughs> like it's <laughs> fangs yeah. have been taken off. It's turned into this little poodle that just everybody likes to pet, you know? Right. And that's, I think, what Bitcoin's become, unfortunately. Like, I hate to say it, and I hate to actually see it happen right in front of my eyes, but even since I got into crypto, which was recent, um, they've been defanging the beast for a long time. Um, and it's just, it breaks your heart every time, you know, you see this and you see that and you see like whenever they're attacking Bitcoin fungibility and you see like things being added to the fungibility graveyard, like, oh, they just confiscated my coins because I went to the cent to the centralized exchange and I put my Bitcoin there and they said, hey, hello, sir, you've been coin mixing and, you know, we don't like that. So we're just going to block your account. You're not going to be able to take any of it out and bye bye kind of thing or uh, don't come back. Your account is shut down or whatever it is. So you're, you know, as much as we in the Monero space say, oh, look, there's another one on the Bitcoin fungibility like else. But but, you know, it's actually painful to see that because I feel like that's an attack on crypto. And I think as a community, that's that should that should affect all of us. You know, like we're if we're fighting for freedom. The Bitcoiners are, whether they like it or not, our allies because they're in the same fight with us. And it's 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 sad that sometimes these allies don't get along or there's animosity or whatever it is. And, you know, we've all been critical and it's just natural, I guess, um, because we get into the minute details. But I think the bigger picture is we're fighting the same fight for human freedom. And I think every attack on Bitcoin, of course, it does help you see why Monero, that's clear, but I feel like in general, that's an attack on human freedom. And what I guess what we have to do as a community is make sure that we learn the lessons. So I think the beautiful, one of the things that I have so much respect for Howard Chu is like random X, you know, that's just mm -hmm. a miracle. That's just a miracle that um, a modern day miracle, like the great pyramids of egypt well in 2022 we have random x that's one of those miracles that we have in our lives and i think that's something that we have to preserve fight for and uh, make you know take the lessons from bitcoin and not allow that to happen to us so how do you so i think the biggest attack vector could be this whole pumping the price and then dropping it like a free free, free fall type of thing and how do you kind of there's nothing you can do about it because we don't have a printer, like a money printer, like, you know, these organizations are backed with money printers. We don't have that. We have to earn every dollar that we put in and, and invest in crypto and all that. But uh, I guess the only way we can kind of become insulate ourselves a little bit from that is creating the circular economy behind the whole price play, you know, mm -hmm. so the price mm -hmm. can play out and play out and play out. But like, one Monero is always equal to another Monero and this, what it can buy should be determined then in Monero prices. Now, 
who's going to start pricing their rice and corn and everything else in um, Monero? Like, yeah. You know, that's that's the next step. So, I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get there, honestly, but I think the, I the think fight we, is worth it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I definitely think we will because we're already seeing it in the dark market. So, I mean, a dark market, mm -hmm. we call it a dark, I hate the term dark market. I mean, it's, it's an open mm -hmm. marketplace. So we're seeing it gain adoption there for those purposes i mean there's kind of their their own circular economy happening in in that in uh, you know in those open markets there whether you agree with what's being sold is one thing or another mm -hmm. but they you know that ecosystem is, is running on its own you know vendors are willing to accept monero and then, then they're somehow able to use that monero to then reprovide their their service so there's, there's some kind of circular economy that's happening there. So if if there, uh, why wouldn't it then just translate into you know the 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 clear net, you know the the surface markets? Mm. Uh, if ultimately an open market is a more efficient market, and I would think as a society we're going to trend towards more efficient marketplaces. I hope so. So I have a question. You know, I've uh, <laughs> I've never logged on. To an actual dark net market mm -hmm. so what do they price their goods in like is it like this is a 0.5 xmr or whatever or is it um in dollar prices i think they show both you know i think they show yeah. you know they'll, they'll, yeah they'll show dollars monero and bitcoin yeah i don't think it's yeah i don't think they're just saying oh, right. you know, uh you know this pound pound of whatever is one monero i think they, they show the dollar price yeah i don't think i don't think it's gotten to that that would be pretty pretty wild uh no so that's what i meant so so the thing is if i'm yeah, always exposed to the dollar unit, or the unit, of price, account, unit of account you want to see yes <laughs> exactly that's what i'm saying turning like we have a successful medium of exchange we have a pretty very successful uh, store of value i think the next hurdle to crack and really get over, and I think this is the hardest one uh, for Monero today is the unit of account. Um, so somebody did crack it. Oh, I don't know if it was a joke. I mean, you know, I don't really frequent the dark markets either. But somebody did put out a tweet. I think it was like yesterday, saying, uh, you know, nobody. I don't know if anybody's aware of this, but like one Monero equals one gram of coke on the dark market, and it's been pretty consistent. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that was. You know, I think it was. It was a joke, but <laughs> I mean, that's like. Um, you know, maybe, you know, that's that's how it's going to happen, right? The unit of account yeah. thing will, will take place in, in some way like that, where Monero starts to naturally equal some other, you know, some other asset that that it's demanded for. Um, and then I, mm. I, I guess that's how we'll start to achieve mm. unit of account. I mean, I use Monero all the time. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, just let's go down this thread for a little bit for, for a second, because you, you know, like you said, basically your path to Monero was out of out of concern for you know these these what feels like an impending dystopia. Um, this idea, financial dystopia. Yeah, this idea. I was concerned about a, a financial globalist, a global yeah. movement, right? So, what what is your your take on that? What do you do? You think there's there is this globalist movement? And it's very real, and that there's an actual end goal there. And what do you think the end goal might be? I mean, you're still on YouTube, right? <laughs> we don't want to. <laughs> hey, um, let's let's see what happens. Let's see how far we can take this. I mean, you know, I think it's it's. Um, let's just say the way I see it is there aren't any coincidences in life. I don't believe in them. I feel like a lot of unrelated events eventually are related. At, so sort of behind the scenes. So. The fact that, look, I'll just give you a small example. Um, my husband gave me um, like a large amount of cash, but it was from Oman. We just moved to Dubai um, a few days ago, literally like three days ago, it's got set up here. But I had Omani cash, like fiat, and I had to exchange it for UAE cash, which is dirhams. So I had reals, I had to go to get some dirhams in exchange. And... Yeah, so I did that, but so I'm I'm over here trying to pay my way in in cash, you know, and places are not even able to make change. Like honestly, when you show them a big um, fiat, you know, bill, uh, you should just see the look on people's faces. I don't know if you face the same issues over there, but uh, 
you know, like making change is becoming a hassle. Like you'd have to, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, but it's just, it's just, it's becoming a bit of a, of an issue. My friends in Europe are telling me that, um, and my husband was in, in Spain recently. He said, um, in Spain, I don't know if, if you've been there, but in the past we used to have every second like little establishment on like one of any of the main roads or one of the bigger streets would always always be a bank you yeah. just had so many banks it was like it was like a plague like they were all over with atms everywhere it was just like there's banks 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 every second or third shop is a bank um and and i back in the day when i started living in spain i used to write a blog and i was reading through it the other day and i was like oh that's just every other shop is a bank and that was one of my main observations banks everywhere banks 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 fine now i see or i'm hearing um and this is not just spain this is like netherlands this is a lot of places in europe where you're just like oh where are the banks gone there just aren't as many bank branches mm -hmm. you know um it's harder to do your um day-to-day -day -day sort of living with only cash mm -hmm. people um are reluctant to make change because they don't even have any or, or they have limited change you know in cash like cashiers and stuff they're just told to operate with cards only so yes i do i do feel like a lot of this is leading us to a cashless society they're just slowly very slowly nothing ever happens you know um bang like all of a sudden oh today we have cash tomorrow we don't it's all just going to be a phases and phases and we're going to slowly see you would one day be looking around your your town and wanting to go to an atm and the nearest atm would probably be like 20 miles away mm -hmm. away and you'd be yeah, like oh do you love coffee and monero as much as we do consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. The, the, the move towards a cashless society, I mean, that, that should be a given, right? I don't think anybody can argue against that. Like, we still don't yeah. use, you know, we're no longer using rotary phones. We're using, you know, smartphones. Hmm. So, I mean, that... That's out of technological reasons, right? There's a reason why it, it doesn't make sense for us to walk around with paper anymore, right? We could we could zap uh, value around digitally, and it's more efficient. Like I, for you know, I'm sure. Obviously, we we become very uh, you know concerned about what that might mean. So we you know we understand that, but I'm sure you use a credit card on the regular. I've always used a credit. Card, you get the points, you know, and it just makes life easier, mm -hmm. and everybody accepts mm -hmm. credit card. Um, but do you think? You know, so that that's happening out of out of just a, a natural progression of technology as we move as we become more digital. But do you think that it's it's also it's kind of um, it's for the purposes of of gaining control of people, or that's just the natural tendency of what's going to happen as as we move in that direction? So you know, cash has no associated cost with it, right? It's if you use a card, um, the merchant the merchant accepting. Um, if there are large merchants, it doesn't impact them as much. It's it's all built into their prices. But like little merchants, mom and pop shops, they always pay a three percent on um, on each card swipe, mm -hmm. and they don't uh, necessarily like they lose out on their uh, sort of margins when they're doing that. So it's. It's not yeah, but a demand, free demand case. really came from the customer, at least here in New York, right? Like the demand mm -hmm. was, you know, I walk into the bodega and if they don't have a credit card machine, I'm walking out of the bodega because I don't have cat, you know, like I'm a mm -hmm. younger guy and I'm just used to using my credit card. And I want the point for me, it's a better deal, right? It's faster. Mm -hmm. I could see all my transactions, see my transaction history, I'm getting points. Um, yeah. That's that's where the real demand came mm -hmm. from. Are you saying it was because because you know, is, is that just the natural tendency or is there this like more nefarious thing going on where they're trying to capture, which I guess is part of the natural tendency, right? They, it's centralization and it's centralization of power and it makes sense for them to, to move. Okay, on. so think about Lebanon, what just happened there mm -hmm. uh, six months ago, or six, eight months ago. Um, those guys had cash sitting in the bank. The bank... Um, told all of them that you're not ever seeing this cash again. It's gone. <laughs> it's ours now. 
So what do you do in a situation like that? I feel like, okay, I'm not saying this is going to happen everywhere else, but I feel like we're just so used, like, you know, here uh, we operate with cards everywhere. It's just, and in, and I was in India recently and they actually use QR payment systems. So there's one called Paytm and there's Google Pay, GPay, that's really popular in India. And literally like you go to the grocery store and you're buying your vegetables and you're you know, getting your dairy and everything. You have little shops dedicated to each thing um, and little vendors, you know, and you, and you swipe uh, and you scan a QR code. So they're at that level now in India. Uh, small vendors, they all have QR codes hanging there. So it's, you know, when the whole demonetization happened in 2016, everybody mm -hmm. got, got into the digital space. I don't know if, I don't want to, you know, sound like a, like I'm talking about like conspiracies or anything like that, but I feel like um, that moved, that, you know, just assured society towards everything digital. Because India is a very, very, very traditionally a very heavy cash-based society. Like everything happens in cash, even the largest transaction you can think of. So that was, I guess, necessary or or not. I don't know. But whatever happened, happened to push everything into. So what you see now in India is interesting because you see a lot of the smaller transactions in day-to-day -day life happen um, through cards or not even through cards. They happen through QR codes. But the larger transactions are still like suitcases of cash kind of thing because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are just wary like that. They're just, you know, they like to keep yeah. things to themselves. Um <laughs> Could we, we, had, yeah, we had somebody on Monerotopia just this past weekend from India and making all these points as well. And um, oh, okay. yeah, obviously, I, I you know I remember when that happened. So I guess that happened. You know, they they want to avoid tax evasion, right? So um, I, I think India has an issue with with collecting taxes, right? So yeah. they want to get rid of cash to avoid tax evasion. Um, yeah. Obviously, they're also kind of they're throwing out the liberties that come with cash at the same time. Do you have any insight into like the the people of India? I mean, are are they um, understanding of the liberty that comes with cash and, and desiring to still maintain that liberty despite what the government's trying to do? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think any Indian person who's aware um, and financially literate literate is is very much aware about the importance of cash. Um, so I was speaking to a friend who moved to Canada a few years ago, and this was just as I was getting into crypto. And I and I said to him, hey, I hope you're saving in Bitcoin and stuff like that. Because um, I knew he'd never have heard of Monero. So I was like, at least buy Bitcoin, you know. Um, that's a safe place to, to keep your money. Um, and he's like, I'm Indian. I buy gold. And I was like, really, you buy gold in Canada? And he's like, yeah, I do. And so, so you know, it's, it's, I guess there's some part of it in um, a lot of Indian people's blood, especially if you've lived around there. I'm not saying like Indians everywhere, but if you have your roots or like your parents were born in India or whatever, I think you kind of inherit this sort of uh, savings practice where you save in gold you don't even save cash. So like everybody knows in India, I think inherently that they got to at some point, like on a regular basis, convert their cash to something more solid. So mm -hmm. people just go and buy, like it's, it's honestly, it's like a family thing where, and you see that here in Dubai and in Oman and the Gulf. Um, it's just what people do when they get their paycheck. It's the monthly trip to the gold shop where you buy your wife something, but it's basically just going to sit in the safe, the family safe. And it's a way to kind of uh, put your money into something um, solid, you know, that yeah, holds and, value. And in terms of crypto, the government there is trying to deter people from using crypto, right? Like I, for transactional purposes, because I think there's pretty heavy capital gains on it, right? Right. 30%. And they're saying um, that crypto is treated as a as an investment asset. So like it's not a currency and it shouldn't be used as one. Well. Right. Yeah. But Monero might be one that they can get away with using because uh, it won't be as, as easy for them to to monitor that. Um, do you, do you think that that you know we could see Monero take hold in a place like India where they have this tradition of using cash and gold? I mean, what what, what needs to happen for that to happen? So honestly. If there is any place in the world where Monero can really thrive. It is India because uh, because just of the attitudes of people, just because of what's 
the mentality that they have, that they, people just have this inherent sort of built-in mentality to get out of fiat as soon as they can, right? Um, and, and exchange it and use it in transacting and like not, and use, or go straight into gold as often as they can um, and store that away. Um, people don't trade gold in India. They buy jewelry and they just put it away, right? Um, so you don't, you don't like, it's a very, it's a very, it's a sign of great distress when you see somebody having to sell their gold because it means they're selling their family jewels and, and that's just not cool. Like that just means they're in trouble. Uh, so you never, you almost never see that. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that the gold buying and selling, like a lot of Western sort of financial gurus, you know, you'd see them uh, monitoring the price of gold, like it's 1800, now it's 1850 or whatever. None of that really happens in India because it's just like, it's just something you just, it's just somewhere you put your fiat, you know, and then you just hold it. And if you've been doing that for 30 or 40 years, you're not monitoring your $50 ups and downs in that fake manipulated price anyway. Like it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's when it's when shit hits the fan insurance. So that's what gold is. So when shit hits the fan, that's gold, that gold that's being currently suppressed to 1800 is gonna become 18,000 or or you know, 8,000 or whatever it is. So we're not like it's nobody even knows because of how manipulated the gold price is. But what I'm saying is it's just this inherent sort of cultural thing of getting out of fiat as soon as, you know, one can <laughs> that I see in people everywhere in India. Um, and I think they just know like they're just Indian people. Um, now it's changing because we finally got a good government since 2014. Uh, but I think in the past, like we've just had one corrupt sort of regime after another that people just lost all faith in um, the system and the ruling um, parties. And, and it's just, you know, India has never really had like a strong single party that has done what the BJP, like the current party has done in the last uh, few years. So since 2014, um, we, India has always had like a bunch of coalition governments. So coalition is you have like five different parties all with their different manifestos and their different everyone's pulling in a different direction and none of them are ever able to get enough votes to you know like single-handedly come to power so they've all had to kind of say okay i'll partner with you and i'll partner with you but i hate you and i hate you and i hate you but we're all just going to partner together and we're going to form this government so there's just if you go to the indian parliament or see one of their sessions it literally is like it's a joke because they're just bickering and no one's ever able to agree on anything so it's a disaster you know in in, in other words and we finally have like a government that's strong and that has like a pretty good you know idea for the country and i think they're doing a pretty good job uh, for the last few years. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons I think <laughs> you never see anything good being published in mainstream media about this government. Cause like, at the, I think at the end of the day, um, we're, tr we're sort of invariably moving to, you know, like a sort of fuzzing of like, of, um, national borders and things like that. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole different rabbit hole. I don't want to go into that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. India is like one of those places where, where, you have this inherent distrust of the system and where a lot of cash is used and gold yeah. is important. So I think Monero could uh, take root over there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll, I'm hoping to go in January with uh, Sunita and that's going to be interesting. Meet some what of her part? Friend, uh, Calcutta, that area. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Calcutta. I've never been there. Um, yeah, so ex really excited to do that. I've never been to India. Uh, yeah. I've, I've had a lot of Indian uh, friends growing up, a lot of close Indian friends. Uh, so mm -hmm. familiar with, you know, different parts of the culture. And obviously New York, you know, uh, it's, it's easy to get exposure to the Indian culture around here. But yeah, never been to India. But it's uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like a complete different world, uh, which is exciting. I can't I can't wait to go over there. And yeah, I would love to be a part of trying to grow crypto adoption in India. I mean, that would that would be amazing. That's the other top choice that's like starting to rise in my head as a potential Monero Topia location would be India. I don't know how how crazy that would be. I mean, so is it is it legal to transact? Like it's it's not that it's illegal to transact with crypto. They just don't see it. They're just not treating it as a currency, but it's not that people can't 
legally accept crypto in exchange for for things, right? Right now. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I don't even know. It's so fuzzy yeah, no, at this okay. point. No. Yeah. But my dad recently sent me um, a write up of a restaurant in New Delhi mm -hmm. that is a crypto only restaurant. Oh, or not there you crypto go. Yeah. Only, yeah. So, but okay. I think they accept crypto. So, they're like, oh, this is, uh, and you know, they named different. Um, uh, things on their menu after cryptocurrencies. So they're mm -hmm. saying this is the Bitcoin dosa or this is like the yeah, the Cardano pizza or, you know, like they're just doing that to kind of, I think, uh, get the crypto crowd and um, they're saying we'll accept crypto as payment. So I don't know what happened to that restaurant and their idea of accepting crypto as payment, like if they still allow them to do that. Um, I, that would be interesting to check up on that. I don't know. So yeah, I mean, one one of the things that people may say though, right, is you know I don't understand India well enough at all, but um, you know, obviously, like you said, it was it was a big big cash economy. So is that one of the things that's pointed to as to why corruption is so rampant in India? Do they blame it on cash? Um, no, I think it's corruption is not to be blamed on cash. I think cash is a result of the corruption. So I think the root cause is corruption and it's just this, uh, this uh, decades old practice of, you know, being selfish, like selfish, scummy, like politicians always being in power. Like you would, when you, you know, when you, when I think of politics, I think honestly of like the filthiest and the most abhorrent type of human being that is attracted to that sort of thing and that gets into politics. So, but that's like India for you. I, I ran for Congress, but, but I know, I know, I know. And I, I, had, I, seriously, I tend to agree I, I with you though. I tend to agree with you. Doug, listen, I completely agree with you. I, I don't, I don't, I didn't mean that for you at all. Like it's just nothing to do with you. And I said that specifically for India, it's literally like the no, crappiest people. It's that here get too. To here politics. too. Are you kidding me? Yeah. There, not and, everyone, and, you know, not everyone, but but that's the thing. Like yeah. in India, you literally have like thugs of the street that beat people up. Next thing you know, they're elected to something, and they're and they're and they've got like twenty five thugs working for them. That mm -hmm. basically all they do all day is beat people up and steal their money, or they shut down their stores and blackmail them and do shit like that. So you know, you're talking about a class of people that have been traditionally in politics in India and nobody even goes close to that. Like everybody with any sort of intellectual um, capability directly goes to the private sector in India, goes to Bombay mm -hmm. and works in finance or, you know, does something like that or goes to like, I, like completely nothing to do with politics. Politics has been this black hole where like the scum of society goes. I'm talking about India's <laughs> Just making it clear. <laughs> it's pretty universal. Let's, let's be honest. It's pretty universal. <laughs> but but yeah, so that's the thing. And I think it's just these people that are, that's all they do. They just steal from others. And everybody knows that, but nobody can do anything about it because no one wants to get involved in that and, you know, get on their bad side or anything. So people just mind their business, but they do everything in cash. So, you know, the tax collection rates in India are like 1% or something. It's hilarious. So people just have, um, I guess, morphed into this, like the Indian, the Indian um, economy, whatever gets reported on like the media and like, oh, the GDP is this much. You can just double that because most of it is in black and they'll never even know what it is. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just the numbers are so fudged. Anyway, so what do, what do you think of that criticism of Monero then? So before we were talking about like risks, I mean, so obviously that's one of the major criticisms that comes up like, oh, well, this is going to lead to, you know, more tax evasion. This is going to lead to, you know, the money laundering, the funding of terrorism. How do you respond mm -hmm. to that? I know how, how I do, but I, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably similar. What, what's your response, especially from from people that you know, maybe are just kind of like getting into crypto and are curious about an invest. Because I, I know you, you, I think you're you're running a, an investment company, right? Mm, so yeah. I, when you're talking to, I imagine they they might bring that up as a potential criticism. What's what's your your response? So a, I don't do tax advice for my clients. You know, 
um, no, no, I mean, the, the there's, there's a criticism as to why they may not want to get involved with Monero because they see it as a risk and that, you know, government oh. can go after it for those reasons. And Yeah, like, um, I don't see that very much, honestly, because people who I speak to are don't know what Monero is mostly. Uh, so they haven't reached that point where they can start to discriminate between crypto and Monero separately. Like they don't, they're not there yet. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't get that that sentence. Like I don't get that feedback that oh, Monero is untraceable, so tax and all that stuff. I just generally have um, like depending on what jurisdiction somebody is is uh, residing in. So that means uh, you spend more than one eighty days, one hundred and eighty days a year in that place. So that that becomes your residence then for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. um, like what sort of tax uh, implications that would have for them um, holding crypto. And I think Monero just kind of for now comes under the general crypto bracket, right? Under the umbrella of crypto. So what I, what I, um, so, I mean, I don't get involved with the tax implications. So that's something that they do. I, my job is to make money and make that, you know, like create their portfolio, manage it and like, you know, increase that portfolio of value in fiat terms because that's what they're looking for and then just give it back to them. And, you know, we have different uh, return schedules and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so tax is all their sort of, um, it's their area. Um, and I don't, I haven't really received questions like okay. that. So what I get is questions about, oh, you know, I'm, uh, is crypto taxable where I am? So currently in Dubai, you know, it's not one of the reasons I moved here, we moved here. Um, but yeah, so depending on whatever jurisdiction, like I'm, I'm a very law abiding citizen. Like I've always paid my taxes. I've always, wherever they're due, like I haven't really lived in very tax heavy, you know, situations really, but like we're exposed to Spain, you know, we have, uh, tax obligations in Spain and stuff like that. Always on time, always like abiding by everything and in India, uh, whatever. So it's, it's really about, um, I, I would say cryptocurrency in general is about giving you that wiggle room um, within, you know, within the reaches of the law. So, yeah, so like staying within the boundaries of the law, how much wiggle room can you have? Like if it's legal to buy crypto where you are you really should be buying some Monero, you know, getting some exposure to Monero, because if you buy gold, then you really should be getting some Monero because again, it serves the same purpose, but in a digital way. So if you remember my presentation, I talked about the six properties of money and literally there's just two assets that we know of today um, that exist in my awareness uh, that possess those six properties. Now, Gold suffers on the portability side, but Monero suffers a little bit on the acceptability side or like its history. Mm -hmm. It's pretty new. Uh, crypto is seen as a risky thing. I think it's just gained that reputation because of all these price um, swings that we've seen, you know, like an 80% drop or 50% drop. Even a 50% for somebody who bought Bitcoin at 60,000 is a pretty big deal. If they're not seeing it go back to 60, then all then imagine the, the mindset of someone who who's as sailor said sell your house and put the money in bitcoin what if somebody actually sold their house and put the money in bitcoin when it was 60 and it dropped to 30 like he would have a heart attack and like all he would be wanting to do right now is wait for it to go back at least to get his investment back because he's in he's in the red right now mm -hmm. so so these price swings have really given the industry a bad name so a lot of my friends in the financial space are <laughs> I guess there's some version of fiat maximalists, you know, they're, they see crypto as like this risky thing. It's like a black hole. They don't want to get exposure because of the price rings. It's never going to be money. There's a ton of arguments. I can show you WhatsApp chats that I have with my friends that, um, and then a lot of them will send me the McDonald's crypto bros. We are hiring sign whenever the market goes down and they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just wait. Yeah. <laughs> Now's the time to accumulate. You know, use yeah, the price these swings are the to same your people that, that once it's going up, they're like, "Oh, should I buy now?" Like, no, you should have bought when you were making fun of me three months ago. Exactly. 
So what were we even talking about? Uh, uh, the the narrow and the tax implications, right? Yeah, like how you were responding to people when they bring up that criticism. Because I thought, what? So you're advising you're advising people on on how to invest, or you're you're basically a a, a wealth manager, or what? What's what's your consulting firm do? So we um, manage and um, so we create and manage client crypto portfolios. So okay. I don't, I manage it on their behalf. So Got I'm it. like, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say it's a wealth management. Okay. Function. And then, so are those people, I assume all those people, do all those people, are they getting exposure to Monero or you're, it's like, you just have a portfolio for them or they're, they're, um, how, how's that? I, I go, I, I prepare a list actually, and I consult each, um, in, you know, each, um, cryptocurrency with them mm -hmm. and explain each one to them and see what uh, they want to get into and what okay. kind of risk profile they're looking for. Monero is for somebody who's got the staying power, diamond hands. <laughs> so, you know, it's not something that if you want, you know, like annual returns at the end of 12 months and you right. want like a moon coin, you're going to probably go with something else. So right. it just all depends what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, because Monero, you know, I think the day for Monero is not anywhere near, like we're not anywhere close to the potential that Monero uh, has at least like now financially speaking in terms of market cap rankings we're at 24 now but i think there's a long way to go to get to the top and and i believe we'll get there at some point but i don't think it's going to be anytime soon so it's really like the diamond hands that are going to see that growth and a lot of my clients would be probably looking for annual returns and so on and so forth so it's a different strategy do you do you explain it to them as gold? I mean, you you were just making those comparisons, but is when you explain it to other people, are you saying are you describing Monero as digital gold? I guess my question to you is too, because there's there's always that like debate right in the Monero community, like should we label Monero as digital gold, uh, or should we kind of shy away from that and, and just focus on its use case as digital cash? Um, there's, the, so, there's the critics, you know, out there that say we shouldn't we shouldn't call Monero digital gold. Well, what's your take on it? I I see Monero as digital cash, but the the beauty of it is that gold, you know, way back in the day was digit was not digital, but it was like analog cash. Mm -hmm. Way back, you know, fiat is not that old, right? Mm -hmm. So. Go a few centuries back, even 500 years ago, gold was cash. Like we keep forgetting that. Right. You know, and why over, is gold time, what it is? It, it kept its its value uh, because exactly. of its and its base utility. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, um, I have a beautiful chart that shows the, the store of value aspect of gold. Everybody just criticizes it because they're looking at all these moon coins. But look at gold steadily over even the last 80 to 100 years, mm -hmm. and you're going to see a really, really good store of value. I'll, I'll, I'll bring up that chart. I don't have it right here, right here, but I mean, I have it somewhere. I'll find that. Maybe I'll, find, I'll bring that chart into my next presentation somewhere. But it's an important thing to note that A, gold was uh, um, co-opted, successfully co-opted by central banks in... Um, so sort of like at the turn of the last century where, you know, the fact that people who were actually transacting in gold coins then kept their coins at a centralized location that came to be known as banks, but they were actually gold storage houses mm -hmm. and they were issuing paper sort of a voucher saying you own so much gold and you can, you know, why not, why, why not? carry all this gold around where you can just have this piece of paper that you put in your pocket. Uh, the, the, and then what happened is those centralized locations that were holding that gold had, let's say, 10 gold coins, but they issued paper vouchers for 100 gold coins. So they were fooling people, basically cheating them and lying to them and saying that, yeah, we have 100 coins here. But if anybody went for an audit to their warehouse and actually checked how many gold coins they had. They didn't have enough to support the paper claims that would come back if they all came back at the same time. So they would collapse. And that's how banks collapsed. Like when there was a um, a run, like a bank run uh, and people went in to get their actual money, which was, you know, 
back in the day, back, back, back in the day, it was gold, right? Mm -hmm. um, which was cash. So gold was just an impractical cash in our day-to-day -day lives. So I, for that reason, I don't see it ever coming back in that sense. And I don't trust any sort of centralized entity that says this is backed by gold. So if you're going to have paper money backed by gold, you're always going to have the corrupt people behind it running that operation saying we have this much gold, but when you actually go check, they don't, you know, um, or half of it is fake. It's copper painted like gold or some, you know, variation of like not having the gold. Right. Mm -hmm. So, which they found in China, by the way, they found like this big gold supplier and then they went and audited and it was all like something else. So that sort of thing, and I think gold loses out for that um, for that reason. But Monero being digital cash, which is what gold used to be, I mean, it's just it's just this beautiful, almost unknown cryptocurrency that very few know about, and that understand its its uh, its uh, power. So, it's so do you think we should be more vocal about it as you know as digital gold? Like, what, what what's your advice to the community? Should we? um avoid that i you know w w what's your take you know what, what should people be out there yeah it's like digital gold like obviously we're saying it is but should we should we be advertising monero as that i think we don't have enough educators in the space so i think really honestly everything starts out with understanding and knowing and i feel like yeah so when i so when someone says oh i want to get into crypto i say my first question are you disposed to studying with an open mind you know you're going to have to ha spend dozens of hours to understand a lot of the stuff that you took um, that you took as basic understanding of the world that you live in. But in order to understand, to really understand crypto and what it means and the freedom that can potentially provide to you, you're going to have to d dedicate the hours that it needs. And, you know, um, um, so like I had a friend who came to me recently and he said, yeah, I want exposure. You know, I trust you. I want to go with you and this and that. And he said, all my friends are talking about crypto. <laughs> and I was like, then that's cool, but please spend the time to study it, you know, and a half an hour zoom call is not going to do that. Like you're just going to have to spend a lot of time to study. So honestly, it's about education. It's about people really understanding, making all the noise that we want. Isn't, I don't think it's going to be as effective as the bottom line education, like from the basics up. Yeah. When, when do you think we start, like we see the Michael Saylor of Monero? Do we ever see the Michael Saylor of Monero? <laughs> like what's your prediction there? Your thoughts on that? You know, this who's going to be, you know, the, the vocal billionaire or whatever that's that starts talking about Monero. I don't know. I don't know. I don't see that. Like Elon, and like what, what, what's your thought on that? What, why had, you know, are you surprised that Elon hasn't, you know, is, hasn't spoken about Monero and said he's talking about Doge or you, that doesn't surprise you? No, I mean, you know, Doge. I mean, how many Doge are there? And how many more are going to be be there? So right, right. But Doge, why, why isn't Elon talking about Monero? You know? I mean, you know, you know, he's not. I mean, do you think he's like you and me trying to keep his, you know, like small small wealth like protected? No, he's got billions to preserve, and he's 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 a different league, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't see it. I honestly don't see like a billionaire defending Monero anytime soon. But you know, that may be a good thing. Okay. No, no, that's, that's a good take. I you, think it's a grassroots movement. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that gives, uh, you know, Monero potentially, you know, uh, added value and more resiliency, right? For all those reasons we're saying. So you have people that get into it out of, um, you know, a passion for, for what it stands for, which makes it more resilient to attacks. Hmm. You said, uh, you sent me some qu people, I guess somebody had sent you some questions from your last interview. Want to quickly hmm. uh, run through some of them? Okay. Uh, I see reason why reason why XMR adoption goes so silent and unnoticed. So somebody, I guess he was asking you um, why, I don't know. I, I, I guess he's, he's, he's asking kind of the questions we've been asking. Why, why aren't more people uh, cognizant of Monero and, and adopting it? Why is it 
being silent. I guess you kind of went over that, right? You're saying it. I think, yeah, the question was, I think, related to Monero went from on Jan 1st, 2022, it was um, market cap 42. Mm -hmm. rank, it was ranked 42. And today it's uh, up to 24 and we flipped uh, Bitcoin Cash and we're closing in on CRO coin. CRO coin is uh, the coin of uh, crypto.com. Are you familiar with that platform? Um, crypto.com? Yeah, crypto.com. They sponsored the, um, in LA, they sponsored the Staples Center. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Right, that, so that was a big deal that they just did. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a pretty big crypto company, especially on this side uh, where where I am. So their coin, I think, is a few steps ahead of Monero right now. So I think it's a one billion market cap in addition to Monero. So if Monero is right now three point seven, this coin is uh, four point six. So uh -huh. almost a billion dollars ahead of Monero. And so basically for Monero to flip uh, Polygon Mat Matic, which is 21, Sierra coin is about 19. So Monero to get into the top 20, Monero needs another uh, $55 added to its price. So for every $55, Monero at the current supply moves up by a billion market cap. So yeah, I think it's going pretty unnoticed. Like I think the jump from 42 from Jan 1st earlier this year to the 24th spot so like now we're in the 20s uh is um uh, well there hasn't been much noise except for a few of us on twitter and on reddit that talk about it now monero's in the top 25 now monero's you know crossed 30. so other than us nobody's speaking about it there's no well actually yeah uh, i take that back coin telegraph i think did a thing that monero was the fastest mover in the bear market mm -hmm. or some, mm -hmm. something about that um Oh, yeah, one you, of the fastest, you get fastest. to the point where they they just can't ignore it anymore, right? Because it's just gonna look silly yeah. if they do. What do you think? Why does it go so unnoticed or unspoken of? I mean, um, well, I think you know the most of the market is is controlled by Bitcoiners, and mm. you know, I I think they see it as competition. Um, you know, whether you know some whether they want to admit admit it or not. Um, I think some do, and that's why they, you know, they defer mm. to. Well, just use Monero if you have to, but it's not something you should, should really buy and hold. So, mm. you know, I, I think because they control most of of the marketplace, those that that hold Bitcoin, uh, they're reluctant to promote Monero. That that right. that's uh, I think the, the simplest explanation. Right, um, right. Next question: CBDCs. Do you think CBDCs will be a, a, a potentially a catalyst for Monero adoption? I think so. I think that'll be the um, fuel to the rocket, or however they say. <laughs> mm. And then he's asking, will other privacy coins lift as well uh, with the tide of Monero, if Monero lifts? I mean, I think if they're solid, if they're solid coins, then why not? I see that Monero might be unreachable for a lot of people. Um, let's say Monero does, you know, another billion in market cap. That's adding fifty-five dollars to its current price, so that's around two hundred and sixty dollars. So two hundred and sixty a pop is, you know, so how much can you accumulate at that price? So when they see something like ARRR or some of the other stronger privacy uh, enabling coins cryptocurrencies out there, then they'd probably get get a bit of that as well, you know, because they're like, oh, this is just important and we can, you know, transact privately and they understand the benefits, then they start categorizing. I would say that at some point, people who really start to grasp what crypto is all about and when, so, so this is what I feel. I feel like Bitcoin so far, we've had a pretty, uh, pretty, um, like a positive environment in the world. Like there hasn't been a crackdown on crypto. There hasn't been sort of this attack on sort of private transactions and so on and so forth. So I feel like Bitcoin thrives in a world where governments are friendly, you know, crypto friendly. Mm -hmm. If they're not attacking crypto, then your Bitcoin is going to do really well. So I think that's one of the reasons it's done well uh, price wise. Uh, but I feel like the more uh, we move into a hostile sort of world, 
a more dystopian world, then you're going to need something much, much stronger. And I think that's where Monero comes in. So, and, and I mean, I mean, talk to anybody on the streets even, right? Nobody can deny that we're moving into that sort of scenario mm -hmm. with a lot of seemingly unrelated events that are happening all around us. But I think it's all pushing us into this. We're going, obviously, like you said, cashless is sort of like a, like a given at this stage. Uh, but with cashless, that's an easy word to say pretty quickly, but that's a big, big thing for a lot of people in the developing world, especially, you know, who use a lot of cash in their day-to-day -day life. So like I would go to something like Thailand or Vietnam, you know, there's a lot of cash there, right? So, I mean, unless you're talking about these large cities like Malaysia, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, like a lot of these societies, I think a lot of the developing world, South America, they, they use a lot of cash. So going cashless is not a small deal. It's a really big deal. And yeah, and I feel like um, Monero is something that is more uh, resilient to a more dystopian, sort of like a more hostile uh, financial environment that we're, I think we're moving into. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate, though, that, you know, some people may look at, you know, the price of Monero at some point and be like, oh, I'd rather mm -hmm. get, you know, a uh, pirate chain or, you know, mm -hmm. Monero. I, I, I do mm -hmm. think that's a distraction from from the goal. And mm -hmm. those that do that, you know, may get mm -hmm. suckered into doing it because they, they don't really, you know, it seems like the smart thing to do like why get one monero when i could get a hundred pirate chains i don't even know you know but like you know end of the day that's really not how it's going to flush out um but yeah but in terms of predicting yeah sure i think uh you're going to have silly people do silly things as, we, as we've seen in the crypto market it, most of the time so that's probably a pretty good prediction um are you going to be a monero con no no okay. that's that's in june right no yeah. i'm not Okay. Okay. I was going to say mm -hmm. I'd see you over there. Um, yeah, but I, I think I'll see but, you in Spain, right? Yeah, I'll see yeah. you in Spain in July. Okay. Very exciting. So what, that'll be good. Yeah. What What is that conference called? That's uh, what, what is the name of that one? It's, uh, it's called Mallorca Bitcoin Day. I'm sorry, Mallorca Blockchain Days. Yes. Yeah. Looks cool. Exciting. I mean, the location looks amazing. So yeah uh excited to see you over there it sounds like it's mm. gonna be it's like slowly turning into a monero conference i think uh, it looks like it right they're <laughs> pretty um they're opening up so it's specifically i went through it through their website and it says we're bitcoin only you know we pride ourselves on no shit coins and they felt like the bitcoin conference had a lot of shit coins apparently so they're like no this is a bitcoin only and Monero. <laughs> so I think it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's exciting. Yeah, it's yeah, funny. It's exciting. I was looking at some of their old, like their promo video, and it's all shots of like Tone Vase. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too happy when uh, a couple of Monero <laughs> speakers roll in. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe slowly win Tone over. You know? Hopefully. I hope, I hope he's you. there. And you. we can do a few friendly punches with him. <laughs> I really like Tone Vase. I, really, I feel like yeah. he's the narrow guy at heart, but he's just so embedded in the, you know, in the Bitcoin struggle. He refuses to 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 give up that ground. Um, Spain is a good place to have a few drinks and like really turn people. <laughs> yeah, I think we could do that. <laughs> we could manage. We get Tone Vase drunk off of, off of some red wine and uh, convince mm. him. Yes, yes. All right, Nat. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Thank you for waking up super super early before the sunrise to do this. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you, Doug, for having me. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Of course, and uh, yeah, look forward to chatting again soon. Me too. I, you want to let people know where to find you? I feel like they, they already do in the Monero community, but go ahead, get, let, let, give people your, you know, your websites and your Twitter handle, etc. My company website is neilcapital.io, and my Twitter is namsardar, N-A-M-S-A-R-D-A-R, and um, you know, I think I'm soon gonna get into the education space, so look out for that. Oh, exciting! Something's awesome. coming up. Do it. <laughs> do it okay. all right <laughs> thanks again we're gonna close it out thank you all right cheers thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to our show on youtube odyssey itunes spotify stitcher 
or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.